Long-term projects are kind of funny in a way. There's almost a sense of attachment to the process itself. You find comfort in approaching that goal that you set. And of course, there's a tremendous sense of fulfillment with all the work that comes along with it. And yet, when the time comes to finish that project, to take that final step, to see if all the hours of planning, effort, and work that you put into the process has been worth it, that is almost something you're scared to do. And that's why a lot of projects go unfinished. You're simply attached to the process. But in our case, I don't want to stagnate. So our goal for today is to start taking that final step. So, where'd we leave off? We mocked up a number of systems last week, but we didn't cover everything. And I guess it really starts with the final piece of the puzzle that we haven't really talked about yet, the wastegate. A wastegate is a valve that controls the flow of the exhaust gas for the turbo. And in my case, it is an external wastegate. It's effectively a little piston. Pressure builds up on one side until it's strong enough to open the flap and release to the other. And that's how it controls boost. Our goal is to run a wastegate tune. And what that means is our boost threshold is going to be limited by whatever the wastegate springs determine it to be. And as you can guess, these springs are adjustable. So we have a ton to pick from. And right now we have absolutely no idea what's in there. Could be five pounds in there, could be 50. Who really knows? So we gotta be careful and we're gonna use a clamp. With the mystery amount of force on the inside of the wastegate, if we wanna change it, we need to be safe. Or at least safer. So I decided to use this clamp before undoing the top portion. And you don't have to worry about the top portion being vacuum sealed or anything like that. It's quite literally just a number of springs in there. And since these springs are adjustable, you might be wondering what we're going to be running. Since wastegate help determines your limp mode, I'm gonna keep it somewhat conservative with 12 PSI, the green and yellow in other words. As far as plumbing the wastegate goes, we have four holes we really care about one of which we're going to use, and the rest we're either going to cap off or ignore. The two holes on the top where the springs are, we can completely ignore, and we don't even need to cap them. The two that are on the bottom half of the wastegate, however, we care about quite a bit, one of which we're gonna put a port on, running it directly to the short end of our N75, and the other we don't have a use for, so we're gonna cap it. And I guess before we jump to final assembly, we need to talk about heat management turbos get quite warm, especially when you decide to change where they're located. So we need to account for that. And to do that, we gotta take everything off once again. First things first, while the turbo is out of the car, now's a great time to torque down everything that's hard to get to once it's all finally assembled. So that is exactly where I started. Next, I started working on the first modification for heat management. The oil drain line that was supplied with the kit happened to be made out of rubber, which is a little weird to be honest, since silicone is very similar, but melts at a much higher temperature. So for now, I swapped it to a silicone line I had. I have a turbo blanket on the way. That didn't make it here for this episode though. We do, however, have some heat wrap made out of titanium, which should be able to reduce some of the heat generated from our downpipe and specifically that O2 pipe from CTS. Everything being up top near the firewall generates a lot of heat, so our heat management has to be top tier. And I've heard some pretty great stuff about this titanium wrap. There's a number of brands you can go with, but I went with a name brand one because I figured if it's going to work, I want it to work as well as it can. And my goal here is to wrap the entire O2 pipe. You wanna keep it tight and go around overlapping by about half or a quarter inch. And when it comes to the two parts of the pipe with the ports, I doubled up the back end so that I could leave those ports untouched. Kind of a strange technique, but it did seem to work. And there's no adhesives or anything keeping this in place it's entirely friction and wrapping it into itself. That and these metal zip ties which you put around the ends. These things are absolutely sweet. Mm -hmm. 
After this though, if I'm being honest, I couldn't really think of anything else we needed to do before final assembly, which is kind of crazy given how long this process has been. And in all honesty, I was kind of scared. Up until now, this whole process hasn't exactly felt real to me. It's always seemed so far-fetched. Building this kit from pretty much scratch with no experience has been an idea that I've wanted to accomplish for an incredibly long time. And the last couple weeks, it's been exactly that, an idea. But at this point, I don't know if I can even call it that anymore. As I am on final assembly, it's really no longer an idea. It's reality. Something I'm not only doing, but am almost done with. Obviously, this kit's not going to work perfect the first time, and we're likely going to have to pull a lot of it off to make some improvements, but for the most part, the kit itself is going on for hopefully the final time. Or at least all the main components are. And that means we have to toss gaskets onto every single piece, and the correct hardware with the proper torque specs. Given how everything fits together, you kind of have to assemble it all at once, or not at all. The O2 pipe has to go in first, otherwise it won't clear the manifold, and once the manifold is in, we can talk about the turbo. It goes in next. However, it's not going in alone. We have to include both the coolant drain and the oil drain because they're on the back and once the turbo's in the car, we have absolutely no way to reach back and tighten them without taking the turbo off. So, hopefully we did that. And from here, we get to wiggle the O2 pipe into place. It is a pretty tight fit, but once it's lined up with the turbo and the gaskets in place, you're good to torque it all down. Or at least, so I thought. There's a lot of flexibility in the fitment of this kit, and this final assembly was where I really learned that. It turns out you can't tighten this O2 pipe fully, otherwise you can't get the wastegate in there, and you can't get the wastegate lined up. So really what you have to do is get everything loosely in place and then tighten it all at once. And at this point, I really thought that, that just went for the O2 pipe and the wastegate. So that's exactly what I went and did. And the one thing I was more grateful for than anything else during this entire job was extensions and wobblies. Some of these bolts on the back of this kit are absolutely inaccessible unless you use a really weird, obscure combination of them. So without it, this wouldn't have been possible. And from here, you get a great view of that port that we're going to run directly to the N75. The N75 is kind of like this engine boost controller. So that is one of the most important lines that we're going to be running today. I also did have to undo a good amount of the heat wrap in order to get everything tight. But once it was, I went ahead and started installing both the other coolant line and the oil feed. And this was right about when it was hitting me that this was real. If I played my cards right, the car could start today. But maybe I should just put it off, buy myself some more time, triple check everything again. I mean, we don't even have the downpipe yet. My buddy still needs to bring it over. Never mind, I guess. I guess at this point, I don't really have any more excuses as to why we can't continue. So let's press on. My friend brought back the downpipe that he and I tacked up in the last episode. He was kind enough to finish welding it, and now all we really had to do was test fit it. Metal likes to warp when you weld it, so there was still a decent chance this wasn't going to fit as we originally planned. And unfortunately, that was true with this case. Rather than beating around the bush though, he took it back to his shop that day and brought it back a couple hours later with the modification needed to make it fit. The downpipe was on, and I moved on to reassembling the intake and the charge pipe with all the hose clamps we need to make them functional. And the intake specifically, at the moment, I would describe of as a temporary solution. In theory, it should work, but I think we could definitely do some modifications to it to make it flow more air and look a lot better. Our charge pipe, however, is a pretty solid design for what we need it for. It was really just a matter of buttoning everything up. And the closer I got, the more anxious I became.
if we want to start the car, we can't exactly just fire it up. After all, this car's brain is still convinced that it's running a KO4, so we need to change that. And Modiza helped us out again, sending us over a bass tune for the car so that we can actually fire it up. And this tune is effectively just a wastegate tune. Its purpose is not at all to push the capabilities of this car or this kit. Its purpose is to give us a tune that we can play with and drive the car around with so that we can shake out any mechanical issues with the kit itself. And it's precisely set to run no more than wastegate boost so the car doesn't hurt itself. One more thing checked off the list. And after that, I reinstalled the strut bar, one of the first things we took off, and the last thing we're putting on. The car was, technically speaking, ready for fluids, and that is a weird thing to say. I was so hyper-focused on each individual design aspect of building this kit and upgrading this turbo system that I kind of forgot to notice how fast we were actually going. Sure, you could definitely do it a lot faster, but for me, this being the first time doing something this custom, I'm just thrilled we were able to actually get this far. We are just about ready to start it. I am very excited, very nervous, but... I'm gonna come double check it in the morning and then we're gonna drain it, put the exhaust on and do all that tomorrow. And if there's a mess, we're not scrambling at the end of the night. It's probably better to start with a fresh head anyways, but I'm excited because then we can actually drive it during the daytime too, which is nice. One of you guys also pointed out that I forgot a copper washer here. So before I left tonight, I tossed that in. Big thanks for catching that. I then spent a solid amount of time the rest of the night double checking everything. I was pretty paranoid that starting this wasn't going to go to plan. And I don't really know how much of that apprehension was legitimate, but I don't really think you need a legitimate reason to be anxious. It's a part of life, and it's something that is very prevalent in situations like this where everything you're doing is new to you. So at the end of the day, all you can really do is find ways to cope with it. And for me, in this situation, that coping was double checking. I woke up in a sort of daze. Confused, concerned, anxious, everything was bleeding into the same emotion. And I don't know if there was really a word for it. Uncertainty is the closest I can come up with. I just didn't know how this day would go. My goal was to start the car and go for the first drive. And the first step in doing that is to hook up the downpipe to the rest of the car. And then after that, we're on to fluids. Speaking of exhaust though, I do think I want to put a nicer one on this car. It definitely deserves it after this point, I think. It's also worth noting that as far as the oil drain goes, it is routed as as far as it can possibly be from the downpipe. Another thing to check off the list was this additional port that I had added to the downpipe. You can probably guess what it's for, but we're gonna plug it with a wideband O2 sensor right now. We'll worry about what we use that sensor for later, but for now, I don't really want that hole in the exhaust. And it's a lot easier to route this now than it would be later. That nameless emotion the uncertainty was growing. I should double check everything again. I'm sure I missed something. I mean, I'm sure another week or so double checking would really help. I just don't know what I missed. Past a point, you can only be so prepared. We've double checked everything, so all we can really do right now is take that final step. As nervous as I was, I pressed on. I can't just endlessly check things. I've checked almost the entire kit four or five times at this point. So at this point, I won't really know if there's more issues until we move on. Taking another step forward is going to let us figure out if we need to take another step back. And that step forward is adding oil and coolant. And I mean, what's the worst that could happen if we did forget something? So far, so good. The correct amount of oil is in, and so far it's not leaking from anywhere. Time to move on to the coolant. And naturally, things went absolutely not to plan. We were leaking coolant specifically, and where we were leaking it from was quite possibly the worst spot it could have been. The banjo bolt on the back of the turbo, the one by the firewall, you know, the one I can't actually get to without taking the entire thing apart. What a lovely start to the day. But I guess that goes to show you that we made a good call in pushing this to the next morning rather than pushing on late last night. At this point, my self-esteem was pretty low. 
I was frustrated it was leaking. I figured that was just the start of a trial of error and problems and issues. And I was kind of in a terrible headspace. It took me effectively a long time, but I was eventually able to stop the leak just by tightening that banjo bolt a little bit more. The issue was the clearance and getting a wrench back there. I had to take off pretty much everything, including the intake, the O2 pipe, the down pipe, the exhaust, and all of that just to move the turbo enough to reach it. But about an hour later, we were back where we were, priming the turbo. And emotionally, I was a mess. We need to get oil pressure to the turbo, so we need to crank the engine without starting it. Consequently, I unplugged the injectors and the ignition coils, and then I hopped in the car. It's unnerving to turn the key in a car that's been sitting for months, but I did anyways. And this is exactly where tensions were the highest. We were about to start the car. With everything electrically plugged back in, there was nothing else to do. The car was ready. This entire process has been new to me, every last bit of it. And up until the car fires, this whole process has been nothing but an expensive waste of time, a foolhardy dream, something I never could have done to begin with. What if this was entirely pointless? I mean, what would I even do then? I just don't even know. This wasn't pointless. Not only was the car running, but it sounded healthy. Sure, I could hear a couple vacuum leaks, but overall, it was a lot better than I thought it would be. I kept the front of this car raised for the first start so that it would help me drain the coolant. The approach was to effectively run the car up to temp, watch the coolant slowly get sucked into the system, and then replace it until it no longer did that. You also might notice that the engine is smoking, and that's actually very normal for what we just did. A lot of parts, including our heat wrap, will release some smoke on their first couple heat cycles, so that's normal. While the car was idling, I also went ahead and grabbed a log for Motiza. We'll go very in-depth on the tuning aspect of this car in the next episode, but that log was just a safety measure, and the first step. With the coolant, as far as I knew it, drained, I put the wheels back on the car and for the first time in months, dropped it to the ground. And I completely forgot how low this thing is. I shut the hood and did something I've been dreaming about the past couple months. I took this car on its first drive with the turbo kit that I built. And that is a pretty cool thing to say. We weren't reading a perfect vacuum, but honestly, this was a lot better than I thought it would be. It's about what the car was before. And even though I wasn't pushing the car by any means, it was absolutely surreal to be behind the wheel again. In a weird way, I've really missed this thing. So even though the drive I went on was slow, I was enjoying it a lot. Wow, the rev hang is bizarre. It's almost like this car has started over in a way. When I first bought it, there were issues I didn't even know about, and we had to find and fix them. Well, with this kit being so new, that's happening all over again. And even after just this quick little drive, I can tell there's a lot we need to work on. It's gonna be really fun though. Something I didn't expect. 
I'm gonna pull over and double check that our coolant is not bad, but good sign. Good sign. We still have good vacuum. I'm gonna check the coolant now. The car wasn't overheating, our coolant didn't drain anymore, and overall, I couldn't be happier. Once we get this thing sorted, it's going to be an absolute blast. Oh, that's a long time coming. Holy crap. We're still not overheating. And our coolant seems to be good, so might as well drive it some more. I'm going to keep you posted. It's RPM hunting just a bit right after throttle, but honestly, pretty stoked with this so far. I think we should actually drive it now. While this is a really big step for the car, there is still quite a bit we have left to do. The list for this car is honestly pretty huge. This kit is still entirely untested. We need to fix vacuum leaks, pressure test, rebuild the intake, double check everything again, and retorque everything after it's been heat cycled. And honestly, I could just keep going, but I'm not going to right now. That's all a story for later. That's all part of the continuing story that is this car. Today, I just want to relish in the fact that it's back it's drivable. And while it is an imperfect kit, I am utterly thrilled to be able to drive it again. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like and subscribing for more. That is the best way you can help support me and my content. I've got a lot planned for this car, the other cars, and the channel, so hopefully you're excited. Either way, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day.